Turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians 4, and as you're turning there, if you came here for a carefully orchestrated, coordinated, and carefully crafted service, that's probably the church down the street, so. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate Samantha, and I appreciate uh, Christian and uh, uh, Cody there for um, coaching us along there. We got a few glitches in the system, but praise the Lord. Ain't it great? All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We are going through our sermon series on the book of Thessalonians. Let me read our passage from chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, specifically that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, Whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Thus far the reading of God's word. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, as we address again the, the subject of sexual purity, which you have designed man for, and how man has fallen from that uh, perfect standard. Uh, Father, give us uh, sobriety as we, as we hear this message. Give us um, insight into how you would have us uh, govern ourselves and our passions, uh, cause us to love one another in holiness and purity, um, and give me boldness to declare the word boldly as I ought to speak. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, we've been discussing God's will for all believers, our sanctification or holiness, specifically the three ways that God makes us holy. He separates us from the world, number one. Number two, he purifies us from our sins. And number three, he invites us to participate in the life of Christ through the ordinary means of grace, through the word, through the sacraments, and through prayer. In verses one and two of our text here in chapter four, after he encouraged the Thessalonians to continue to, to walk and to please God just as you are doing, Paul reminded them of his earlier instructions or commands given to them through the Lord Jesus or by the authority of the Lord Jesus there in verse 2. In our study of verse 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, we discovered that our initial sanctification occurs when we were converted. That God makes us holy, he justifies us, and then he purifies us so that we might be in his presence as we were discussing a little earlier during our Sunday school. And that our progressive sanctification, understand that our initial sanctification, and that our progressive sanctification are increasing in holiness and being made more Christ-like occurs throughout the entire course of our lives and is only perfected when we die and enter into glory. As our catechism tells us, we are then made perfect in holiness. In the meantime, we are on a trajectory. We're on a trajectory upwards generally with lots of dips and crannies. Until then, however, the Holy Spirit renews us, that's our initial sanctification, in the whole man after the image of Christ, and then he enables us, that is our progressive sanctification, more and more to die to sin and live to righteousness. We also discussed an apparent situation last week that Timothy reported to Paul concerning sexual immorality at the church in Thessalonica. And that's what prompted Paul to, to write this section that we're in this morning and last week to remind them again of what he had taught them while he was with them. And what we saw in verses 3 and 4, that they should abstain, avoid, resist sexual immorality, that each of them learn to control his or her own body in holiness and honor. We reviewed some strategies last week that the Lord provides for our holiness how God in his mercy has given us three things, three things, three things to wage war against sin. He's given us his powerful word to instruct us and to comfort us. 
He's given his spirit, God himself, to dwell within us and to sustain and strengthen us. And finally, he's given us one another to motivate and encourage each other in the battle. We discussed the need to crucify the flesh, to put those persistent and besetting sins to death by nailing them to the cross and letting them die. I shared with you how the Lord sustained me in a very dark season of temptation by, by reading scripture verses that I'd typed out on three by five cards. We also warned against the idea that we can gain victory over sin by trying harder, didn't we? We talked about that. Trying harder to fight temptation is a waste of your time and energy. Trying harder merely means that you're trying to battle against a spiritual force of evil with your own willpower. Or resisting your flesh by relying on your flesh. You're fighting the enemy on his turf, on his battlefield, with his rules, and with his own weapons, which is a formula for failure. Instead of trying harder, beloved, you must learn, and I use this word carefully, the secret. And I, It's not going to be a secret. I'm announcing it to all of you today. But we're going to learn the secret of fighting sin is not trying harder, but leaning more, leaning more, leaning more into Christ, leaning more into your baptism as a sign and seal of God's covenant with you, leaning more into confession of sin and appropriating the blessings of the Lord's Supper. This is where the battle for your souls is fought and won, in this leaning more into your redemption. Paul described in Ephesians chapter 6 the defensive armor that we put on, the belt of truth, the, the breastplate of righteousness, the, the boots of the gospel, the shield of faith, and the helmet of our salvation. And for our offensive weapons, we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God and prayer. Beloved, these are the weapons of our warfare. Not your willpower, but God's word. Not your own power, but prayer. And by these we are mighty to pull down the strongholds of sin that wage war against our souls. Amen? That's how we learn to abstain, to, from, to avoid, to resist sexual immorality, beloved, and to control our bodies in holiness and honor. Now, frankly, sexual sin wasn't just a concern in Thessalonica, was it? It was a huge problem in Corinth as well where Paul was when he wrote this letter. In fact, Paul addressed this problem with Corinth in his letter to them, especially in, verse, uh, in chapter 1, uh, I'm sorry, in 1 Corinthians chapters 5 and 6. In chapter 5, Paul addresses the problem of the man who committed incest with his father's wife, presumably his stepmother. According to Leviticus 20, if a man lies with his father's wife, he has uncovered her nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. This kind of relationship was a capital crime, a crime punishable by death. And listen to how Paul describes this offense in chapter 5, verse 1. Listen to how he put it. It is actually, listen to the tone of it that he's giving. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife. Even the Gentiles didn't do that. That's what Paul is saying, in other words. Here's what he's saying. Are you kidding? You've got a guy who's having an affair with his stepmother as a member of your church? And you're proud of that kind of tolerance? Kick the man out. He makes this important distinction about the nature of sexual sin in chapter 6, verse 18 of, of 1 Corinthians. He says this, flee from sexual immorality. Our passage says abstain, but in, in Corinthians he says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin that a man commits, a person commits, is outside of the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God. Paul addresses sexual sin again in his letter to the Colossians in chapter 3, 
and also in Galatians, where he describes the works of the flesh in chapter 5. You get the idea that this is a common problem in in the Greco-Roman culture. Beloved, it's a problem in every generation. Can we just be blunt? No one is immune from this. It is a problem as it continues to be an ongoing issue in the church today, as we'll see this morning. Our message again this morning is that we should reflect our status as God's people by our purity and devotion, particularly in the matter of sexual ethics, or in other words, proper versus improper sexual behavior. In our passage, we uncovered four instructions regarding our sexual behavior as believers. Number one, we are to control our bodies and our passions. That's what we covered last week. Number two, We are called to be different from our pagan neighbors. We'll see this in verse 5. Number 3, we are commanded not to take sexual advantage of one another in verses 6 and 7. And finally, in verse number 4, we are to consider the implications of rejecting these commands in verse 8. Last week, as I said, we talked about the first point. We are called to control our bodies and our passions. I call that sermon, The War Within dealing with the battle for temptation in our own hearts. This week, I want to address how the church is impacted by sexual sin and how we are to guard the church against corruption, hence the title, Guarding the Church. So let's address our second instruction. We are called to be different from our pagan neighbors. Look with me at verses 4 and 5. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. We talked about this last week. Not in the passion of lust, like the Gentiles, the pagans who do not know God. What's Paul doing here? He's contrasting two groups of people. The Thessalonian believers and their pagan neighbors. The believers are to know or learn how to control their bodies in holiness and honor. In contrast with their pagan neighbors who are controlled by their lustful passions. Do you see the difference? Believers are to learn to control their bodies in holiness and honor versus what we were. We were controlled by our lustful passions. Those who are controlled by their lustful passions are further described as those who do not know God. In other words, since the Thessalonians have been redeemed from their pagan lives and now they do know God and are known by Him, they are substantively different from what they were in the past. As Paul says of the Corinthians in chapter seven, uh, chapter 6, verse 11, listen to how he says it, and such were some of you, speaking of their immorality, their idolatry, their homosexuality, their adultery. But he says, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. This is the basis for Paul's command. Because we are in Christ, we are new creations, new creatures. Do you remember that passage? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, old lives have passed away, and now in the power of our new life, all things have become new. The new life. New power to resist sin. New awareness as our status as new creatures. And a new desire, this is the most important thing, a new desire to please God rather than merely to please ourselves. Beloved, we can't overestimate the power of these lustful passions which controlled us in our former lives. And to some extent, we may still feel the pull on our hearts. The craving for a substance, legal or illegal, or a particular pleasure can take time and prayer to overcome or just to gain some measure of relief. Our calling to be different is accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit, who now indwells us and empowers us to resist temptation, what we talked about last week, as we discussed in great detail. There are strategies that we can employ in our battle with sin, and I encourage you to go to our podcast on Spotify and listen to that sermon again. You may find it helpful. You and I are no longer slaves of sin, as we were before, but rather slaves of righteousness. 
by God's grace, we are different from what we were. And by leaning more into Christ, he enables us more and more to die to sin and live to righteousness. Many of you are familiar with that reality show, Fixer Upper. Anybody else here got that tuned in on your high speed? What is that? Your favorites? They take an old uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines. They take an old Fixer Upper and they completely transform a house. It is a beautiful remodel job with incredible renovations, and it looks completely different from its original condition, yet maintains some of its original style. What's most important is they do it in an hour, which blows me away. It took six months to get a couple of bathrooms done. I was going to call Chip and Joanna and say, get them in here. (laughs) Renovations, fixer-upper. That is not what God is doing with us, beloved. We didn't get a remodel life. We didn't get a renovation. We got a brand new life. The address may be the same. The address may be the same. But that old, worn-out life with its leaky roof, broken pipes, rat, bug, snake-infested, broken-down old shack has been demolished, blown up, torn down, and dragged off to the dump. Amen? That's what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in new Christ, is in Christ, he is a new creation, not a fixer-upper, not a remodeled guy or gal. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. This is why God calls us to be different from our pagan neighbors or those who do not know God. We're called to be different because we are different. We're no longer controlled by those lustful passions, but instead we're called to walk in newness of life. And in light of this reality, Paul provides his third instruction. We are commanded not to take sexual advantage of one another. We come to a particularly challenging section of our passage. Look with me at verses 6 and 7. That no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Paul gives a powerful warning in verse 6 and the reasons for this warning in verses 6 and 7. First, the warning that no one transgress and wrong his brother means to sin against someone by taking advantage of them to defraud them or exploit them. It seems that the apostle is addressing a critical issue that Timothy brought to his attention during his visit to Thessalonica, that certain members of the church were either committing adultery with one another or engaging in premarital sexual activity. In fact, Paul had specifically addressed this particular sin with them during his time there. And he makes clear in his reminder when he says, that we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. Now that the affair, so to speak, had come to light, Paul had to confront this sin and to deal with it, much as he had to do with the Corinthians when he told them to expel the man having a sexual affair with his father's wife. Now let's remember the context of the church during the time of Paul's initial visit and his departure. Many of the Gentile converts were not merely undergoing persecution and harassment from their neighbors or their employers, but also in their homes. No doubt Paul and his partners spent hours counseling new Christians whose spouse had not yet believed or who were openly hostile to the gospel message. Just as Jesus had warned his followers in Palestine that he did not come to bring peace but a sword, So the Gentile believers were likely finding that their enemies were also of their own household. This meant that husbands might be separated from wives, wives from husbands, and long-standing relationships were suddenly shattered. As a consequence, there were often occasions when a believing man and a believing woman might be in close company with one another. Under the stress of those unhappy circumstances, Sexual relationships had apparently begun among some of these professing Christians. 
None of this would have been especially shocking in light of the situation. And yet Paul had given counsel and issued warnings in the past before he was forced to leave. And now he has to do so again. The language of the warning is also important. The first word, don't transgress, means to transgress by going beyond proper limits in behavior. That's what it means to take advantage of a situation. The second word means to defraud or to cheat, to exploit something to personal advantage. And here's what he's getting at. In some of these broken marriages, there might have been a path to reconciliation. Despite the pain of separation, God calls believers to a chaste and a pure life, as we see in verse 7. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Paul took these marriage vows seriously, as he expressed in 1 Corinthians 7. And we should understand as his instructions to the Thessalonian church as well. And what he said there was, if an unbelieving husband or wife was pleased to stay in the marriage, then the believer was not to depart or to seek a divorce or to become involved in a sexual relationship with someone else. Again, the stress of the circumstances may have thrown men and women together in unusual and painful circumstances, which might have been a source of temptation to seek uh, some measure of relief or pleasure in those relationships. Yet it appears by Paul's comment here, then this is what's different about over in Corinth. While they did have the man uh, engaging in a sexual relationship with his, his father's wife, they also had believers engaged in pagan sexual activities at the cult, at the temples of the cults. Here again, though, Paul's comment here is that the guilty parties were actually engaging in sexual relations with other believers. That's what he's saying when he tells them that they should not defraud or transgress against your brother or your sister, as it were. We need to be candid here, beloved. Sexual sin within the church is not a thing in the past or in the future. Rather, it is past, present, and future because of who we are and what we are. New and redeemed creations, admittedly, still struggling, however, with the remnant of sin that clings to our flesh. This is the reason for Paul giving these instructions and his warnings when he says that we're not to take advantage of one another, one another in this matter, it's not a business relationship he's talking about. Some commentators think that's it. He's specifically addressing sexual sin among the Christians in the church. Now, none of us should be surprised here, should we? How many ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, how many churches of Jesus Christ have experienced the devastation that accompanies sexual sin in the pulpit and in the pews. The news media loves to make headlines about a pastor who was caught in the act of adultery or some other sexual sin. This is not a problem isolated to the Church of Rome either, beloved. Numerous occasions of sexual sin have plagued evangelical churches for decades, probably from the beginning, resulting in lawsuits and media coverage, Disgraced pastors forced to step down from their ministries, marriages, and churches divided and broken up. Why? Because men and women did not learn to control their bodies in holiness and honor, but instead were controlled by their lustful passions. One of my concerns for the church in America is for pastors who engage in adultery or sexual sin who leave the ministry for a time, but then start over, planning a new church or finding a congregation that will overlook their sin. We discussed this phenomenon in a pastoral ministry class I took in seminary. And it was pointed to me, pointed out to us, that a pastor has the most extensive guardrails to protect him from just that temptation. He's in God's word every week, preparing sermons to feed the flock. He's discipling men every week. He has elders and deacons who should be speaking into his life regularly. He has friends in ministry or from seminary who should also be holding him accountable. In other words, 
pastors have an entire network and safety net to help us avoid sexual sin far more than the average church member. So to disregard all these guardrails, to commit adultery and betray his spouse and his church, what could possibly prevent him from sinning like that again? Such a man, and I'll say this, in my view, I know not everybody may agree with this, but in my view, is not fit for the ministry and has no business in the pulpit. And I'm aware of men, even locally, who are in just that position. Such things should not be, beloved. Now let me be clear. I'm not saying that such men are beyond forgiveness. In fact, many such men have been humbled by their fall and have been restored to their marriages by wives who love them and display tremendous grace and forgiveness for sins just such as these but not to resume their work in the ministry. I'm preaching mainly to myself, beloved, and my brothers in the pulpit. It's why as a pastor, I need to be alert to temptation. And I need each of you to hold me accountable in my life and to hold each other accountable as well. It's why we guard our hearts and our homes and why our relationships with one another are guided by purity and holiness out of our love for Christ and our love for one another. It's why Paul instructs Timothy in his first letter, chapter 5, verse 2, to treat older women as mothers and younger women as sisters in all purity. There are appropriate relations between us as men and women. We must guard these carefully lest we fall. We cannot kid ourselves or fool ourselves into thinking that these things happen somewhere else, but not in our own homes or our churches, can we? We must learn to control our hearts while we enjoy each other's company. Amen? I have relationships with all of you here, and I hope that they, that they grow, but they need to be governed in purity and holiness. We can't hide from one another and pretend that the other sex doesn't exist. We're called to be friends, but in purity and holiness, brothers and sisters. One of the reasons we meet for worship every week on Sundays, why we gather to pray on Sunday evenings, why, we, why our women meet for Bible studies, and why we're starting our Wisdom Wednesday studies, is to arm ourselves against these temptations which dominate our culture so that we might lean into Jesus more and more. We're in a war, beloved, with the world, our flesh, and the devil. And to think that we can get by on a sermon a week and a little reading now and then is to leave ourselves open for attack from the enemy of our souls. It's funny. We eat three meals a day to keep our physical strength up. And if you don't get your lunch, are you cranky? Do we owe our eternal souls any less than regular and frequent feeding on God's word and fellowshipping with his saints? Thank you for your permissive in my digression here. Not too digressive. Back to our text. Paul's warning also includes two reasons. The first of which he addresses in the second part of verse 6. Look with me there. For the Lord is an avenger in all these things. The NIV says that the Lord will punish men for all such sins. An avenger and a punisher. This is, not a, this is not a superhero movie. The Lord is going to avenge these things. It's an unusual word. The only other reference is in Romans 13, where it states that the civil authorities are God's instruments, his avengers, of enforcing the rules and laws of society. Sin has consequences and sexual sin, especially in the church, has grave consequences as well. And in the church of Jesus Christ, he is the ultimate judge who will guard his bride. The particular danger of sexual sin in the church is that it threatens the community of believers and our status as the temple of God. In his letter to the Corinthians again, chapter 6, he makes this statement. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? 
We just had this subject in our Sunday school this morning, the temple of God, going from the Garden of Eden to the tabernacle in Sinai in the wilderness to the, to the temple in Jerusalem, where God dwelt upon the temple and resided in the holy place with the cloud of glory descended upon it so they couldn't even get into it. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. That's a plural noun there. Your body, that is the church, but it's also a personal that you, as a believer, if you're a believer, have the Spirit of God dwelling within you. In other words, here's what Paul is saying. Cornerstone, don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ? And that your body, both personally and corporately, is a temple of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Each of you and all of you were bought with a price. Therefore, therefore, glorify God in this body, the church, and in your bodies at home. We're members of one another. And as such, what happens to one happens to all. So sexual sin doesn't impact just one or two of us. But it threatens all of us in our community here as believers and followers of Jesus. Does that make sense? We're to control our bodies and our passions. We are called to be different from our pagan neighbors. We're commanded not to take sexual advantage of one another. And finally, verse 8, we're to consider the implications of rejecting these commands. Look with me there in verse 8. Paul's last instruction in this regard is another strong warning. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. That first word, therefore, can be translated. It's an inference. It's for this very reason. The inference is that the instruction that came before to abstain from sexual sin, to flee from it, not to defraud your brother or sister by taking advantage of them, is binding on the believers. And for this very reason, to reject or ignore or disregard these instructions, is to reject, ignore, or disregard not Paul, the messenger, but God himself, the one who gives his Holy Spirit to them. The verse is very similar in form to Luke chapter 10, verse 16, where Jesus, after sending out first the 12 and then the 72 disciples, tells them, the one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me. That's the same verb in our verse, rejects me. And the one who rejects me, God the Son, rejects him who sent me, God the Father. Here we're dealing again with Paul's authority as an apostle, a messenger of Christ, one who is especially tasked with bringing God's authoritative word to his people, a word that must be obeyed just as if it had come down from Mount Sinai in the wilderness, wilderness or from the lips of the Savior himself. Now our position as Reformed believers is that the scriptures contain the very words of God himself and are understood to be authoritative for God's glory and man's salvation. Our Confession of Faith, chapter 1 of the Holy Scriptures, tells us that the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life, is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence, con consequence may be deduced from Scripture. So we uphold our faith in God's Word, attributing the words of Paul as being inspired by the Holy Spirit, just as we have the words of the Lord Jesus himself preferred, preserved for us as Scripture. Therefore, for that very reason, we take these instructions as being the very words of God himself, and we are obliged to obey them, just as we're obliged to obey every other word or instruction or command in this precious book. That's the problem with using the grocery cart method of reading the Bible. Have you all ever heard of that? The take what you like and leave the rest. To reject these instructions is to reject the command of the living God who gives us his Holy Spirit. Beloved, you may choose to ignore some of God's word for a time. But if you are a genuine believer, 
you will suffer the consequences of your stubbornness until such time as you submit to God's authority. Now hear me, I don't mean this as a threat to scare you into obeying against your will. I mean this as someone, personally, who held on to some of his own sins long enough to experience the consequences of disobedience and finally fled to the Savior for mercy and relief. Anybody else in that boat? Sometimes with disobedient children, we just have to let their consequences run their, co run their course, don't we? We love them, we pray for them, but we cannot browbeat them or harass them into obedience, can we? The Lord is faithful. He providentially preserves and governs all his creatures and all their actions. And he is able and willing to restore us when we fall and when we confess our sins. The Apostle John tells us in his first epistle, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If the Spirit of God is indeed dwelling in us, then we can be confident that we will not rest until we are walking in obedience to his word. So there we have it. Four instructions regarding our sexual behavior as believers. We are to control our bodies and our passions. We are called to be different from our pagan neighbors. We are commanded not to take sexual advantage of one another. And we are to consider the implications of rejecting these commands. Next week, we will be off this unpleasant topic, unpleasant but necessary, and vital to your spiritual health. We'll explore what it means to love one another more and more and how we're to live our lives faithfully and quietly as far as we can in this wicked and perverse generation. But this week, let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we long to experience your presence more fully. We long to set down this weight of sin and suffering. Your word commands our lives, increase our love for it and our obedience to it. Strengthen us in our personal battles with temptation. Forgive us when we fall. As we confess our sins, we know that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Purify our friendships with one another. Cause us to love one another with a pure faith as sisters and brothers, mothers and fathers in Christ. We pray these things in the name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, please stand with me as we make our confession of faith and answer the question that has been put forward to the church for a thousand plus years. Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in